10,000 years ago, the first humans were the ones who started consuming cacao as a fruit. Same as the animals, they would suck on the pulp. And then when they bit into the seed, they realized that the seed was extremely bitter, so they would throw it away. By doing this, both monkeys and humans helped for the dispersion of the cacao trees. We'll have very large seeds covered with a, a slimy coating that is very sweet. So the first use of, of cacao was that, those seeds. So you just put the seeds in your mouth and then eat the outside, which was sweet. The seed was incredibly bitter and probably toxic and it's purple. You know, it doesn't look like, at all like chocolate. At some point, somebody figured out that if you ferment the seed and cook it, toast it, it gets really dark, you can grind it and it will make this drink. They would add water, corn flour, a little bit of honey, chili peppers, and finally, very important, achote. It gives a red uh, color to food. They used to add it in high concentration because as you know, Mesoamerican gods used to enjoy drinking blood. The scientific name of uh, the cacao tree is Theobroma. Theos god, broma, food. So that's what we're drinking here, the food of the gods. The Europeans took it back a lot of them had liked the drink that they tried when, uh, when they first began to explore the Americas. It was in Europe that they began to experiment with making solid sweets from the, the cocoa and uh, coming up with the first chocolate. When the Spaniards find that it can become a cash crop, they're going to reproduce it, and suddenly you start getting cacao plantations. When you make a plantation of anything, what you are doing is you're destroying the, the biodiversity of the forest, and you're replacing it with uniformity. And when you do that, nature has a way of getting back to you. In the case of the cacao, was the monilia fungus that start invading the pots and the rot before they can mature. As you're picking the cacao, you can see uh, black pods in the, in the trees. I'll pick those if I can and, uh, and throw them off to the side just so that they don't spread. You can see the fungus every day walking around. You take a serious cut in production. It's a catastrophic infection for a cacao plantation. So in the end, by the 1980s, most cacao growers in Costa Rica decided to cut down the plantations. A lot of that land where, where cacao was grown, people planted bananas, pineapples, things like that. Those are big companies, though, that plant that. The forest has to be completely raised, and then a lot of chemicals are used during the farming of those crops. Cacao is actually relatively uh, uh, environmentally friendly crop, especially the way that it was being planted uh, uh, originally. What makes cacao important is that cacao needs the presence of a forest protecting it from the, from the wind and from direct sunlight. Uh, and also it needs the presence of bromeliads and heliconias and other plants where the midges, which are these water flies that pollinate the cacao, reproduce and live. Cacao by itself is not going to solve the environmental problems, but cacao will force farmers to creating at least partial forests. So it's a form of much more sustainable agriculture. How can you grow a profitable crop without having to dismantle the entire forest around it? People need to know what they get from this forest and how they benefit from it. The environmental services they provide, the products that they have been developed, because if they don't protect it, they will disappear. I think that it's, it's important that people see that we either take care of, of the environment or we won't have chocolate. And that's, that was one of the funny things. When, when, when people talk about the forest and the need of protecting the forest. I mean, yeah, people go like, oh yeah, but I can live without toucans and I can live without sloths and I can live without monkeys, but who can live without chocolate? <laughs>